Well, I'm, it means a lot. I actually feel quite humbled and very honoured. Um, I grew up with a father that was Rotarian, so I know how much uh, Rotarians um, work um, and they're so committed to working in the community as well. So to be recognised for my service to community by a group of people that also do a lot of work um, is an honour. For you, how difficult it, has it been to establish the career that you have? Wonderful career, lots of awards, lots of recognition over the years. But initially, was it hard before you got established? Um, I, think, well, I think there's a little bit of background about my story that sort of feeds into it because I was born into a normal family yeah. and um, I acquired my impairment just before I turned 18. So I grew up um, really um, being socialised uh, with the same views and feelings around disability that most people are. Because right. it, it wasn't me, it wasn't in the family. Um, and so when I was first diagnosed, I suppose there was lots of shame. shame? I was only eight, 17, mm -hmm. and I thought this was an old person's condition, and I, I didn't know anybody else with a physical impairment. Um, yeah, there, there was shame and grief you know, those sorts of things that we often don't talk about. And for a long time, I tried to hide, hide my impairment and I would make up stories. You know, if I was limping, I would say to people, oh, well, you fell over or I had an accident. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's important to put that in context. There's quite a journey. So um, when I was studying, because I was actually trained as a dancer and was really encouraged to continue for a couple of years when I was first diagnosed, which was great. I thought the specialists knew I was, wasn't going to be a dancer, you know, because of the impairment. Uh, but did that and had a passion for the arts and ended up sort of falling into designing. And then I decided I need to get some formal training. And that's when I moved to Adelaide in 1988 and went to ACI Arts, which was at that stage the Centre for Performing Arts. So the coordinators knew about my impairment and were quite supportive. But, and you know, some of my peers and my group. But I think I always felt I needed to work harder, do more, um, it, you know, to, in a way to prove yourself. So I think for people with disability, often we'll go, go through that and try and be the overachiever um, to do that. So uh, that's a bit of my story. And it was also interesting um, very early on, being a designer, you have to make models with your hands with scalpels and, and things. It's very hard work and I would have to start paying other people to do that work for me. But I wouldn't tell my employer. You know, I didn't want them to know that because maybe I thought maybe they wouldn't think I was as good as another designer or that sort of stuff. So very early had to, to do things like that. Um, and, and as I started to tell employers, like particularly I remember um, Gary Stewart from the Australian Dance Theatre, he, he knew about my impairment and I remember when they moved from the old building in Guja Street, which is like all these stairs, to their new home, the first thing he said to me, this is going to be so much better for you, which was great. But I did have experiences of discrimination, often very subtle um, um, and towards, with attitudes really. Over the years, have you noticed a change though? for people following in your footsteps, is it easier for them to get work and to be accepted? And are they judged just on the sort of the standard of work they do now? I think sadly, we probably still haven't come far enough really? for people. What um, about overseas? Are we definitely, and I've spent a lot of time in the United Kingdom. Yeah. And in fact, uh, I had a Churchill Fellowship and went and spent four months there in 2000. And ten. So they're more accepting overseas. Yeah, th yeah, absolutely. And um, people with disability can get into training, into education, and there were programs put in place uh, to make like foundation courses, particularly in the arts for people. I think historically the visual arts that has been a, a place that people may have been able to get training. You know, there's that whole history of outsider art and the value of that. But still in this country, we don't have diverse casting. For example, you, we still see non-disabled people playing disabled characters on stage. And for a lot of people, you grow up and you don't see yourself represented, which is terrible. So people often don't have those aspirations. And I heard a terrible story just recently about a young boy um, 
with disability and he thought when he, he, when he grew up he would die and because he'd never seen um, a disabled person on a film or TV. And I think that's really sad. I think with culture, um, the reason we have arts and culture in a way is to tell stories um, and collective stories and about experiences and to see ourselves represented. Because I think art is about asking big questions about meaning and things like that. And so if you're a person that doesn't see yourself represented on a stage or, or on film, or, or you don't hear your stories being told, you are made feel like an outsider. And that really needs to change. And that's part of the work that I'm really passionate about. And That's the thing you love to do, to actually what, go out to schools and to uh, organisations yeah. and, uh, and theatre groups? Yeah, go, yeah, go to... Um, well, there's a number of things. One is supporting people with disability right. or, or deaf people that want to pursue the arts, whatever art form that is, to support them to do that. And that's a role that Access to Arts um, plays a strong role with as well. And the other thing is to go out to arts and cultural organisations, work with them to improve their access and inclusion for people. Because sometimes a person with disability just has an access requirement um, for example, a deaf person may need an um, Auslan interpreter to be able to go and see a play that anybody else could see any night of the week or, or to attend a meeting. And sometimes that's hard. It, um, it does cost some money. It's not a huge amount of money, a lot of these access requirements. In fact, um, it, yeah, most things you can do cost nothing. Telling people that they're welcome and you want to include them is number it's one. It's and just that, the first step. Isn't and that doesn't cost anything. Yeah. Um, and But also, um, I will mention the Adelaide Festival that I'm sure lots of Rotarians would know about and have probably been to things at the yes. Adelaide Festival. They've made a huge commitment to access and inclusion over the past few years, um, working with me and with Access to Arts. They do audio description, they do Auslan interpretive performances and Writers Week uh, do that. Um, last year they also had a placement uh, for a blind woman who worked on Writers Week, which was fantastic. So actually getting people engaged in the organisation. They're doing World First, the Adelaide Festival, and they're really open and committed and um, took out a major award last year. Which, yeah, which is great. Girl. As we wrap it up, on yeah. behalf of the, uh, the Rotary Club of Adelaide, thank you for your time. We're sorry that you can't be with us at the luncheon today. Mm. But on behalf of us all, congratulations on uh, your award for this year. And we wish you all of the love and all of the success in the future. Thank you. And I'd just like to say again, thank you very much to the Rotary Club of Adelaide. And really disappointed I can't be here for lunch, particularly at this beautiful venue that you're at today. But I'm hoping maybe at some stage you'll invite me for lunch anyway and I can get to thank you all in person.